Hello everybody and welcome to episode 71 of Competitive Magic with the Carnies. I'm your host from Italy, Andrea Mengucci, and joining me today we have the full Carnies United from Spain, Javier Dominguez. Hello everyone. And from Australia, Anthony Lee. Hola. Okay, it, it was um, quite some time since the last episode of the three of us together, but of course the Pro Tour happened, Pro Tour Chicago. Congratulations to Seth, Seth Manfield for winning his third Pro Tour. That's a that's a great achievement. And uh, yeah, and let's talk about what happened to the Carnies because we also had a um, fantastic time over there in uh, Chicago. Again, of course, uh, congratulations to the member of the podcast, Javier, who qualified to Worlds with his 12-4 record. Unfortunately, not good enough for the top eight, but nonetheless, a fantastic performance. So... Congrats, Javier. Uh, congratulations to you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I was going to say, like, well, at least you didn't say, like, congratulations and condolences, you know? No, but Anthony <laughs> obviously had to say People it. love yeah. saying that. <laughs> I, I know. I mean, obviously, like, it kind of sucks to be nine, especially, like, when you're the only one and making it with X4 or whatever, but... I mean, as days go by, I mean, I know already the deal, right? They have some nines already. So when you make a nine, it sucks <laughs> in the moment. But, you know, every day after so that, again, it's like just fine. What were the other, what were the other two nines that PT you have? I think it was Battle for Sandicar and Kyoto Art Station. That's I right. I think. Yeah. Uh, the Pretoria story improves. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, half three nines, I think, which is a lot of nines. But it is what it is. Um... I mean, it was a good tournament, obviously for me. Like, but it always feels like a little bit mad to have to have a lucky weekend and still not be able to convert into like a good result. But I mean, after all, it's been a week already, right? And I feel better about it just because it means I keep being somewhat consistent, or relatively speaking, at least not as much as Simon, <laughs> you will say, <laughs> but but who happens to top eight every tournament? But I think I'm, I'm being. Um, Pretty consistent, so that probably helps. Like, it's different to go, like, you know, top eight, top eight, good result, top nine, then go, like, bust, 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 and the only weekend you have, like, in your whole life, it's ninth place, right? Which was, like, the other times. So, definitely from a privileged position or whatever, where I have some top eights before, it definitely helps, you know? Like, nine doesn't feel as bad as it did any of the other times. This, this was, like, a an okay nine, if you know what I mean. Like it's the condolences part should be small compared to the congratulations because I also made worlds. Actually, the first thing I said it was to Anthony was like, "Well, you're not getting rid of me <laughs> for worlds yet." And yeah, is it true? It's and very yeah, true. I mean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so because also, it, yeah. I feel like um, the ninth that you got is like, as you said, less bitter also because you won. Like your how many of your last matches did you win? Like three last matches. I think I won five zero on day two in Pioneer. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So so let's say that you know obviously um, it sucks to get ninth, but when you win your five uh, last match, it lets of a sting. Then let's say like you win your last match and you get ninth. You know stuff like that. Mm, I don't think that makes much of a difference, honestly. Like if you don't have any top, and you get nine, it's gonna hard like for me i don't think I it's know, a big I difference know, I, I don't think it, i mean, I think that's a different thing for most tournaments but i think for the pt if you have not a eight or whatever i think it doesn't matter much like i don't even remember how did it do in the last rounds of those tournaments i mean if i specifically try to remember i will remember but like it's not like you know one year after you don't even remember those things that much anyway but i know what this i, I know what you're saying like you go, you end xo you're like yeah. wow you know it's good but <laughs> It's it's funny uh, because a lot of people uh were they asked me if they if Javier knew that he didn't top it because he was so happy after he knowingly became ninth, right? Which is that that shows like he really didn't mind that much. You know, I mean obviously he would have preferred to top it, but the big thing for him was that uh for those who don't I think most people didn't know that if you give a twelve four record, you always qualify for the world championship, regardless of whether you finish in the top eight. So Javier was celebrating that he had guaranteed worlds and people thought he was celebrating um, that he made top eight when he, you know, probably didn't and they didn't realize he didn't know that he did know. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's something. I yeah, mean, I mean, I mean it's kind of like, I mean, obviously being in nine, yeah. 
Yeah, you can choose, right? At some point. Yeah. Like, I mean, I could choose to be sad about ninth or choose to be happy about the walls. And I'm lucky enough that I could choose there, you know? Like, sometimes things in yeah. life just come like with a bad thing. But if you have a bad thing and a good thing, I mean, it's just like a personal thing. Right? I just try to focus on what I got. And obviously, I mean... I think getting walls actually a big deal ish. It is. Uh, I mean, Anthony always says I might get it there any points anyway, but I might not. And also, it just gives me like a lot of like, you know, like space to actually security. Do, I can do your medium year and still, yeah. Uh, it's like winning NRC actually in that regard, right? Where you can just love yeah. walls and that that's pretty good. So I mean, it's probably better because of the match points. I, I don't know exactly know how it works, but definitely twelve four. I assume will have like a decent uh, amount of points going forward for qualifying yeah, if, for. If, if, the next PTs, yeah. like the next year, first PT or whatever. So yes, it does. <laughs> you have to date to one of the next two. Like I, I don't exactly. I, I I don't really know that much how the system works because I made top in the second one, so I never look at it and I have not looked at it yet. But I assume if I make day two or something in the next ones, I should be qualified for the next first PT anyway next year. So I think it was a result worth celebrating. Like. You know, having half qualify for the next year, PT, and Wolves qualify. It's good. Obviously, it's on the top eight because, you know, you play a PT, you want to make a top eight. But definitely, we'll take this before, obviously. Like, 2-4 is a bit lucky. and But also, you know, like, I think it's... Wor- yeah, I, I just choose to celebrate because I think it's worth celebrating. You're chilling. Okay. Uh, the rest of the top eight is a um, really nice top eight with a lot of uh, um, really good name. We have, uh, of course, the winner, Seth Manfield, who um, defeated Simon Nielsen in the final 3-1 uh, to one with his uh, Raptors Vampire deck that the Team Channel Fireball came up with. Uh, Simon Nielsen also on a fantastic uh, run. This was his fourth uh, top eight of a uh, professional event in a row, which is, uh, as according to BDM, it's a record. Yeah, it Nobody is. has ever it done it before. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Great congratulations from the Carnies to, to Sam and Nielsen, the, the player of the year. Also, uh, did you guys know about the the thing that happened during the Pro Tour Lounge? The the sort of the um, you know the that they gave a trophy to Simon and like did you guys know about it? Well, yeah, we, we were right we there. were there. We actually we yeah, we, no, we, no, actually, like, we actually we actually before. I don't know how we knew, but all I knew was like we had to stay there to see it. Like we, I mean, like we had to stay there because we wanted to see it. But that's why we can went late to dinner. So it was worth staying though. But <laughs> once it was yeah, over, it we was, just left. Uh, <laughs> it was strange though, because like you know, uh, basically they handed uh, Simon the Player of the Year trophy with a little bit of a speech. Uh, but it was it was really nice. I had the the pleasure of being in first first front kind of casually, and yeah, it was it's cool. just like Simon is yeah. so much good vibes. Like, yeah, it's for sure. Like, I don't have to say it better. I'm sure Anthony will make it more accurate. But it's like he's such good vibes that sometimes listening to him to talk about stuff gives you joy. You know what I mean? Like you're just there chilling, waiting for the announcement, or whatever, and he stops, starts talking, and it's like, wow, you know, this is so emotional or whatever. Like, uh, I get these vibes out of him a lot of times, and I think that's very good. Very cool. I think that's accurate. Yeah, si- Simon, like, good vibes is literally just <laughs> Simon. It's just always so cheerful. All the time, very wholesome. Yeah, cheerful. Cheerful is the word I was using. I think. Yeah, thank and you. And also, an, another person that I would say is good vibes of the time is Christopher Larson, who also uh, top eight at the the Pro Tour. Congratulations uh, to Christopher, another fellow Danish player. We have also Sempardi, Alec Fredrissen, Adam Edelson, Jean-Noël de Pra, world champion in the fourth place. Uh, Simon, uh, Seth Simon, Christopher Larson, and Mingyang Chen. So. Um, quite a nice top 8 there, but also quite a nice top 16. I mean, the PT now is just it's really cool. It's really cool to see uh, all these players again, and this tournament was no no exception for sure. This is, yeah, this is, a, um, this is a real stacked, huh? Look at this. Like, Look at how many world champions are just in, that you're looking at right now. You've got JD, Seth, uh, Javier, and Utah all in the same. That's four. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wow. That's for top sixteen. <laughs> well, ap- apparently, if you win worlds, you will are more likely to top sixteen the, the next PTs. So that that would be the <laughs> conclusion, that right? the like conclusion you can possibly make. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the format, the pioneer format. Uh, you guys uh, both came up with uh, Is it Phoenix? Although your team was a little bit split, some other players were on Amalia combo. Yeah, I just want to ask you to. Uh, 
tell the listeners uh, what did you think about Pioneer? What was your testing process? Why did you choose this uh, uh, is a Phoenix list that I'm gonna uh, show? Of course, if you're watching on YouTube, we have the um, the camera. I have the camera on, and I screen share things I talk about. So, for example, we have the list: Javier Dominguez, Planeswalkers, Two Ashiok Dream Render. Tell us a little bit more about this. Well, it's the same story as always. Anthony suggested something weird. We tried, and it was good. Oh yeah, this was this one was actually pretty funny because I remember <laughs> Javier was just sitting on his bed and he says, "Can we find a card that a main deck card that would make us better against Phoenix and Lotus?" And I said, oh, "What about Ashiok?" And uh, <laughs> and he thought about it and I said, and I was thinking and I said, "I'm serious, by the way, because you know that's uh that's a, that's always a good sign. Good clarification. When, 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 yeah, when yeah. I have to say." By the way, I'm not joking. I'm serious about this. And I say, I'm, I'm serious, by the way. And he just snaps. I know. And he, I'm thinking. <laughs> we ended up and we did try it. It was, uh, it was very good. Um, the big thing about Ashiok specifically is that it's um, it's both proactive and a hate card. So we're not really just main decking a hate card. The Ashiok, even if its first ability has no relevance, is actually kind of... Well, it's, it's a functional card. I'm not going to say it's fantastic. But... The ability to mill yourself potentially for eight cards just if you untap with it is pretty strong. And it doubling up when you have Temporal Trespass, for example, can be quite critical in going off. Like, it makes your Trespass much, much better. So, yeah, the, like the ability to get a big edge in the mirror uh, and against a worst matchup in Lotus, which were two matchups that we felt were very important, was made, made the Ashiok very appealing, I think, along with having a reasonably high floor. And honestly, like, were we going to play like pieces of the puzzle or some other unplayable thing like that instead? No, so the opportunity cost wasn't as high. Yeah, so one thing that people may not know is that uh, Ashok ability is interesting because even if you mill yourself, your opponent is still going to exile their own their own graveyard. So I'm going to say that in the mirror match, it's super key to just resolve this, mill yourself for four, exile their graveyard, and you know even if Ashok dies, it already did uh, a decent uh, a decent job there. And of course, stopping an emergent ultimate of it's it's the biggest deal. I remember testing against this card with Lotus post sideboard, and it was very, very good. And oh, yeah. It's yeah. Really cool well, it's, it's, it's even better game one. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. The card is like yeah. a much better card game one, right? Because if you consider, like, you know, for example, like even in the Phoenix matchup, the like the, the two good things you have going on are like Phoenix and Cruise, and Ashok shuts off both. Like, post board Ashok does tend to be like a little bit weaker. There are more, there are answers to Ashok post board, obviously. There are cards like Mystical Dispute or Spell Pierce running around, and there are like ways around Ashok. But in game one, there's like not really that much you can do about Ashiok realistically, so you end up having a very large edge in game one. And you know, classic Phoenix, when you add like one or two of a card to your deck, and you have so many cantrips, you see that card very often, and it's very impactful. So, yeah, it felt like a real edge to be advantage even just in game one. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely felt like this this uh, this time the deck carried quite a bit, like compared to last year Pioneer, where the deck was already medium. And I did this only mostly because I needed like well on a run very hard or whatever. Obviously, I got lucky this time also to go it too, for sure. But like, I felt like wow, this deck is good. I was just playing like <laughs> this works. Like, like everything is working as we planned, kind of, you know. And that was a good feeling, to be fair. <laughs> I think our team did yeah, a very good job. Yeah. Also, also against decks like uh, Amalia combo, stopping yeah. uh, return to the ranks on turn five or six, and Court of, of Calling, Court of Calling, of calling also. Yeah, like the, oh yeah, it does sure. way more than if I like I even like you can exile like memory of the Louis. like it does more than the, like the the first I you know sees like it, there's a lot of small interactions for this card in the format. And also, just milling yourself for so much turns on all your cruises, so your pick lock prankster can always pick up cruise without having to worry about graveyard, and uh, yeah, definitely definitely a, a very good hit. And uh, I'm not surprised yeah, if the, it, it's also like the, uh, the, the, the the their deck is organically very well prepared to actually protect post smokers. If you think about it, like it has removals and blockers. So even if you need to true. protect yeah. Ashok, <laughs> you can just go like you know turn two, free the fire, turn three, removal prankster, and, and they're not gonna kill it. Like like it's very like the deck is often positioned in a, in a way where you can just untap with Ashok, and if you do that, you know sometimes it can just generate so much value, like you mill three times or whatever, that's a lot, you know, you get an iteration on some Phoenixes or even, yeah, as Anthony said, like, and we remember testing some turns where, like, you will go cruise into Trespass because you milled so much with Ashok and that's a, or cruise into cruise or whatever and that's super powerful. Yeah. So, definitely a big uh, difference. Sure. Obviously, the cost and, is, is there also, right? Like, it's a clunky-ish card, 
but yeah, it was good for me. <laughs> yeah, for example, when I was playing uh, Rackness Vampires, my opponent played this on turn. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but, and it wasn't that impactful. But I guess that's a card you side up against Rakdos. Yeah, that's the biggest. Yeah, case. absolutely. Yeah, I was suspected yeah. Rakdos to be very bad in the tournament. Uh, we didn't know about yeah. the vampires. Uh, yeah, so... let's. Yeah, let's go to the natural follow up, which is uh, the um, article from Frank Carson that analyzes how the decks did in the tournament. It's always a uh, uh, some really nice thing to to look after the event, right? And uh, is a Phoenix at a fantastic win rate. It was the most popular deck, and it had the. Uh, a 57.5 win rate knowing like everyone knew that it's a phoenix would be the most popular deck and yet it performed so so well this is you know kind of speak for itself right like it's clearly the best deck in pioneer well it was clearly the best deck i think it is probably the best deck i don't know about clearly the best deck i mean i mean there's just a new variable that we have to account for we have to see where the rackdoss vampires could contend for that but yeah, I mean, I think Phoenix, other than that, I think Phoenix. If I had to guess the best deck, I would say Phoenix. Yeah, I mean, that's why we played it, right? Weapon Cushion. Well, yeah. We played Phoenix just because we thought it was the best deck. Like, not not yes. because of medic position or whatever. It was, it was more like a situation kind of, the, of it's kind low, of the opposite, power. You know? Right, yeah, exactly. Like, it's specifically it was, it was not like, well This deck is too good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's bad, a bad opposition, but the deck is too good not to play for this tournament. So we're just like going to well, play it. But, a lot yeah. of it was comfort as well, to be fair. Like, I do think a lot of it was that we felt very good about like how we could play Phoenix. We thought that you know we had the right people for, to play Phoenix. Like you, me, Nathan, <laughs> I, I'm, Isaac. I'm, like, I'm going to admit well. I was not that confident <laughs> on the I inside because confident. I didn't play as much. I know you were, but I was not as much, especially after I kept losing to everyone in testing. But yeah, <laughs> after the tournament, it worked well. So... <laughs> Like I almost played yeah, Lotus Mango. Did you know this? I I was no. I was close. To oh, this is play yeah. Lotus. This is this was this is good actually. Like for the first time ever, maybe me and Javier were gonna play different decks. It was it was kind of scary, you know. The whole process of choosing Phoenix was kind of uh, shaky, you know. I mean, the, the, the... yeah. So for, Go on. for me, it was kind of obvious that Javier would have played Phoenix because, no. of course, Javier. <laughs> Is a very well-known Phoenix player with PT Top 8 in London, uh, in Modern. And I was like, in testing, Phoenix was just so much better than anything. Even, uh, you know, I was going to play Lotus and then I kept just losing to Phoenix uh, post sideboard uh, that I decided to switch. And just, it was a little bit too late for me to to learn Phoenix. Um, but yeah, for me, it was, uh, it was just so clear that Phoenix would have been um, your deck of choice. I'm surprised to hear that you were going to play Lotus. What was well, the reason? Wow, it was like literally the opposite. Like we were like, it was very unclear to us whether Phoenix was the best um, to begin with. Like at the end, after we found Ashiok, then we were more sure about it. But before it was really close between that and Lotus. Um, and yeah, Javier kind of, he had to be dragged a little bit until the Ashiok, I think. <laughs> like he was maybe wavering before. Um, so... Well, at the yeah, start, it, it was hard. Should yeah. we just go? Should we just go to the start? I actually think this is kind yeah. of interesting. All right, so yeah, let's go. Our front runner when we first got to uh, the PT testing house was actually Incarnation. Can you believe that, Mango? That we were all very close. <laughs> to, we were all, like we were tentative. All of us were tentatively locked on playing Incarnation. Okay, like it was a new version I of. I tested it. I tested it a bit. I, I did not like it. <laughs> but we had a, we had a new version that was a very very large improvement. All right, uh, I, w- I won't go into the details there because um, it's a lot. But we had a version of incarnation. We all tentatively locked, but there was a big problem where it wasn't really playable in paper because the deck was just so slow. And the first day I pl- and we were like, okay, we have to figure this out once we get to the house. Try it in paper. So I played the deck, and you know I was able to play it fast enough, but only by sacrificing so much accuracy that I was just playing it absolutely horrendously. Like. I was like, is this fast enough? And Javier's like, yeah, that's fast enough. I'm like, okay, that's no good then because I, I was playing horribly. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's no good. And I was, like, I was like, all right, I'm off it. And then when Javier played, he said, hmm, this is a concern. And if anyone knows how fast Javier plays, if Javier plays a deck and he's like, mm, I think the clock might be a concern for me, that's doomed. So that was well, already in my defense, strike. in my defense, then I played against Nate, we were like 15 games and it was average eight minutes. Yeah, but, but that's the first like two games were very long. <laughs> yeah, two of the fastest players, you know, on the pro tour. And then and then, so and then we also realized the deck just wasn't as quite as robust as we had thought it was. Uh when the metagame began when the pioneer metagame began to open up. So we were off incarnation. 
and uh, that left us in a in a bit of a spiral, you know. Um, so what happened there was that there we started to split, which was, um, you know, me and Javier have played the same deck for I don't know how many years. It's a lot of years, and I don't think we've ever once considered actually splitting on what we played, right? Um, well, you pretended to be close to play out as, but I knew you. you yeah, I mean that was that, that, that was that was coping, you know. I was always gonna return to the great yeah. house of Rakdos mid range, but here we were like legitimately very conscious of maybe playing different decks. So um, yeah, I think I think that makes sense though because Anthony and I actually have some similar strength playing, but the one of the biggest differences I have a lot of uh, combo background from Legacy, and Lotus actually runs into this. I think that was the difference, right? We had yeah, that time. was the difference. Like, Javier was just so much more comfortable playing combo, and he also thought the Lotus deck was better. So Javier was very close to playing Lotus, and I was going to play Phoenix because my um, my assumption was that if Incarnation didn't work, I would play Phoenix no matter what. So that was that, um, and it was it was very tough because the Lotus deck with Archmage's Charm we thought might actually be broken, and it was really really unclear. And after playing some sets, uh, it seemed like it might be. Um, so I think at that point Nathan was very likely to play Lotus. I think you can agree with that, Javier. Like, <laughs> I'm, was... I blame Nathan. I mean, I went to play Lotus yeah. because I just couldn't beat Nathan. Like, I mean, that's a classic. Yeah testing process where you cannot beat Nathan. So it actually happens often. But this time it was like, wow, I really cannot beat Nathan. <laughs> like, with any yeah, way. and Javier, Javier was losing it. Like, he was like, oh my god, I think, I think we have to and try Nathan, to Lotus. Yeah. Yeah. And Nathan said, I mean, Nathan actually thought we should play Lotus, right, as well. He like, did. He, talked, he said, like, when well, Lotus is maybe a little bit too good, that's why I'm playing it. And I think you guys should actually learn. So he was strongly believing that Lotus was good enough, right? So He yeah, was thinking was it was point. that good. Um, and uh, out of the people who were like, you know, who, who locked Phoenix first. So Nathan was definitely Lotus. Tabby was probably Lotus. I was probably not Lotus. And Isaac was like, definitely not Lotus, basically. He was just locked on Phoenix because he knew that deck so much better and had to catch up on draft. So with all of us divided, I asked um, Paulo for help. Um, you know, the elite spellbinder, because he's ancient and has a lot of ancient wisdom. And he asked me a lot of questions, which made me realize um, whether I should play Lotus or not. And I ended up deciding not. They were really good questions, honestly. Like, um, you know, I asked him a lot of questions about the value of uh, how, like, how much better does Lotus have to be than Phoenix to justify playing Lotus when I don't really know it that well. I want to have to learn it. And for example, he pointed out that you know, uh, it, it would it would detract from a lot of other things if I had to spend all my resources into learning Lotus now, for example. So how much better is it really? I said, well, I would do. It, would it be substantially better than Phoenix? Is that like good enough? And he's like, I'm, I'm like, does it have to be broken? Like, is it enough if the deck is just substantially better than the second best deck? And he said, well, I mean, if you think the best deck is substantially better than the second best deck, that's the same thing as broken. Do you think that's true? I was like, hmm, that's a good question. So I just went around to all the other teammates in the house who were going to play Lotus, and, like, and asked them. Do you think this deck is substantially better than Phoenix? And none of them said yes. So I was like, well, okay, that probably means they don't think the deck is broken then. Because, I mean, framing it that way was easier. Because if you ask someone to tell you, is your deck broken? Most people are going to say no, right? Like, it's just a big ask. But if you are, if you just frame it as, is, do you think this deck is substantially better than uh, whatever the second best deck is, it was a lot easier to get um, an accurate answer. So after I decided that the deck wasn't broken, um, and after weighing up a bunch of other factors, I ended up deciding not to play uh, Lotus, and then started Convi working. Yeah, to you also, yeah, you also convinced me in the process. <laughs> like, yeah, I and he was doing all of these, yeah. and I was like, being like, oh shit! I mean, he's actually on point, right? So that's probably like it's gonna be my case too. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. It was very, very hard. Um, but in the end, we ended up deciding to play Phoenix, and then from there, we started working on it, and that's what. Uh, we found the Ashok after we'd kind of tentatively locked it in. I think Javier might have been like, had, a, had a small chance of exiting, but... Um, no, I, I was locked. Like, Monday locked, morning, locked, locked. I was locked in Phoenix. Yeah, like, I was wow. locked. I could feel your doubt. Happened. No, no, because I, I don't like to switch votes. Like, I think yeah. having one or two... Having two days to prepare the deck actually makes a difference. Like, yeah, two sure. days could be the difference between Ashok and not Ashok, right? So... It was, yeah. That was... Um, yeah, I'm also playing the matchups. I don't know. For me, I, I, I was like... If this call is wrong and Lotus was a better deck to play, that's fine because at least I'm gonna use these two days to make Phoenix better or learn how to the uh, how to play the deck better, so I can actually you know make that gap smaller anyway. So yeah, Ashok happened. 
that was a good timing. I mean, we eventually convinced Nate back. I, also, that was funny because he convinced <laughs> me to play Lotus or whatever. At the end of the day, he was like, well, do you think this is like actually like too good not to play? And I was like, yeah, let me think about it. But after an hour, I was like, yep, yeah, so you should definitely play the Ashok with Phoenix. <laughs> And then somehow, literally, five other people on the team convert, which is somewhat unprecedented, honestly. That was very strange. Like, it just started with two, then three, then four, then nine. And I was like, what? What's going on? There's just so many Phoenix players in the end. But yeah, um, maybe it was yeah, But those players also didn't have, didn't have, like, a home. Like, I yeah, think exactly. They virtually no one, no one, no one, like, jumped from Amalia to Phoenix, right? It was players that didn't know what to play, so they were yeah, exactly. obviously going to default to the deck that most people will play or the one that's more intuitive to play which I think in this case, I mean, definitely not Heroic or Amalia, so like Phoenix is hard but it's normal magic so it's yeah, hard playing. to some extent Yeah, especially yeah. with playoff formats or modern or legacy or whatever, it's more intuitive than playing like yeah, Heroic were that is well, a weird deck, <laughs> you know? that is a weird yeah. deck if you watch Simon play, that is it's a lot harder than you, I mean a lot of people like at a basic level you're like, oh you just play your dudes and then put tricks on them or whatever and then you win that's a very basic idea and then as you get to know the deck a bit better, you realize that, you know, it's actually pretty hard, but then you watch Simon play, especially in testing, you're like, okay, that deck is just... <laughs> Even if you're like a pro player, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna... This is too hard to, to pick up in, in a few days. Yeah, it's also like a... Diff- <laughs> like, it's not that... Like, I don't think the deck is actually that hard. It's just like the difficulty is very different from other decks. That's, yes. That's, uh, maybe that's, that's more accurate. Yeah, that's more accurate, for sure. Like, yeah, if you knew the tricks, you could probably do it, but it's just so hard to figure that stuff out. Yourself, exactly. Like, if you have someone that actually tells you how to play these decks, I actually think they're kind of easy, but you need to have that player. Otherwise, you have yep. to figure out everything by yourself, and good luck. <laughs> Credit to Nate, by the way. When he wanted us to play Lotus, he literally said, I will give you four hours of coaching on Lotus if it will help catch you up. And that was... No, uh, yeah, absolutely. He definitely nice. offer, yeah. offer, yeah, offer all this help. Uh, and that, that, I mean, having someone like Nate just being willing to teach you the lines of a deck like this definitely, you know, makes it like a more reasonable option. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very grateful for that. But at the end of the day, we tricked him into playing Phoenix. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was that was how we ended up picking up. It was it was a lot like from the outside, it probably looked like we just locked Phoenix from the start. But uh, no, it was actually quite a circuitous route. And for a moment, maybe maybe me and Javier would have split, but we didn't though. So that's nice. We can save that. We'll split sometime, I'm sure, but not today. Yeah, next time we build a broken combo deck and you, <laughs> you know run away. I mean, you played Tron, so. You know, I don't know. I don't know anymore. <laughs> maybe we, maybe we are locked forever. Yeah. So yeah, Mengu definitely not locked. In. I mean, I actually never was a big fan of Phoenix uh, in Pioneer overall, but definitely not like. I mean, I like last year. I was like, I'm just gonna play Ragdos since the beginning. Like I was hard lock on Ragdos all the time and never blinked about it. Kind of. Uh, well, this was not the case. Like it was. This was like the actual opposite. It was more like well. I think I can play this deck well. But, I mean, for real, I was not very confident because I also just kept losing the matchups. Like, I will just play matchups in the house and I will only win the minor matchups. Like, I will play against Control, <laughs> lose a lot, play against Amalia, lose, play against, like, you know, Lotus, obviously lose as well. Like, definitely, let's say it was not on my highest confident moment, but you I think he gave me plans, a though. small yeah. speech. Yeah, he gave me a small speech, so it was good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually learned, like, yeah, stuff. I would say- I would say my experience with Phoenix was mostly playing against it a lot, and uh, they deck just had very, very few flaws, like, again, uh, I felt like it was winning every matchup, maybe Lotus was the only um, struggle one, but it got, it, it was like so much better post cyborg that, again, I, I, I went in a testing house, so I went to uh, Chicago um, a couple of days before the um, the testing house to to uh, test some more Pioneer because actually I didn't have that much time at home to, to practice Pioneer. Uh, I went with the idea to try to play Lotus Field at the Energy Series to see how the deck works and, you know, um, how it performs in like in paper because I've never played it in paper before. And it was very fun. I um, ended up ninth with the version with the Archery Charm, which was the first time for me playing the card this weekend. And it was really good. Um, so I went to the testing gals thinking, okay, I'm gonna be playing um I'm gonna be playing Lotus. But then when I ran to the testing house, there was Willie Edel with his Ractus deck, which gave me the most severe beats I've ever received. <laughs> he just like we did several testing sessions where I didn't win a match, like actual XO. 
and it didn't even feel like that. I didn't think it was that bad, but I guess Willy just, I don't know. He always, like, I guess, mulliganed to, to the good hands. Brazilian master. <laughs> and, yeah, and just always beat me. So I was like, okay, so Raptus is a bad matchup. Um, and according to, yeah. And and then we played against Phoenix post cyborg, and also it was tough. And then, you know, it's a deck that... I ex- I honestly expect the Lotus Field to be super popular. I thought it would be the second most popular deck because mostly because I just didn't expect Rakdos and Control to be playable. Like in testing, I felt like both Rakdos and and Blue Eye Control were terrible decks, and I'm surprised that so many people showed up with them. But you know, still, um, Blue Eye Control and Rakdos are super popular. So um, Lotus Field was just the fourth most popular deck. But I ended up switching off of um, Lotus and picking up Amalia, which I thought was Oh, and, and another reason for switching off of Lotus was the rise of uh, aggro decks. So Boris Heroic won both challenges by Hamuda, and uh, a lot of players uh, in my testing group started trying the Boris Prowess deck, right? And um, another, another deck that was a very bad matchup and that was kind of on the rise was Izzet and Soul. So you had all these like decks that weren't so popular before and just became popular the very first weekend before the PT, which kind of scared me as well. Um, so I decided to um, up off the Lotus Field. Um, I thought that Amalia was actually decent meta game because he was beating up on these aggro decks. He was okay against almost every other deck except Blue Eye Control, which again I didn't expect to be super popular. Unfortunately, my Amalia list sucked. I didn't have anybody to brainstorm with, and uh, I ended up doing poorly with the deck, but. Amalia, I think, was a, a very good choice if I if I had a, a decent list uh, to play. Well, when you said... Yeah, about... I think the, the best... Go yeah, on. sorry, I just finished. I just say that the, the, the best choice remains is, is a Phoenix. And to me, from like a lot of my teammates, tested Mirror Match of Is It Phoenix uh, very long because they expected the same. And it was like this. I think Is It Phoenix was definitely the, 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 the deck that comes out of the PT as the best one. You can say Raptor's Vampires... It also did well, but it still did like poorly against Phoenix. I mean, it went like 50 50 against Phoenix, which, you know, isn't isn't the best place to be, but yeah. I mean, the thing with Vampires uh, is it was Team Channel Fireball only, where Phoenix yeah. was like every kind of player. So definitely the Vampires, I mean, if, you know what I mean, right? Like if Handshake plays a deck that only Handshakes play, the winner's going to be high, right? And so it's Channel yes, Fireball yes, deck only. Yes. So it's going to be like. Yeah, that's what I was trying to push uh, back against. Like, I. Yeah, I don't know. I, I thought say the same thing. 60% for win rate. I didn't say like they had the sixty percent win rate. I just yeah. said it did uh, fine overall, but it's just fifty fifty against Phoenix. So yeah, but I'm, so I'm saying is sixty percent if it's only Team Channel Fireball is not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, like I, I think it's actually yeah. less impressive than fifty seven plus five or like a gazillion players in terms yeah, of like how powerful the deck is. It's honestly insane that the most popular deck that everybody thought it was the most popular beforehand got a fifty seven win percentage at the PT. That's actually not like, common. Usually, decks like do, this I mean, is yeah. better than Ogak. Better than Ogak. Oh well, I guess. But mm, we don't use this word. Can, can we, we, we don't like to use this word the brakes here. A little. Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. use. No, I said. Yeah. Win I said. <laughs> yeah. Win percentages wise, it did better than Ogak. Sure, but I, I mean, I, I still wouldn't frame it that way. That seems. Um, yeah, it's dangerous. different because. Yeah, I don't think it applies actually. I mean, I, I understand that the literal numbers are like that, but I wouldn't present those numbers specifically because I think that implies something that. Um, it didn't happen true. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, nice try, though. <laughs> yeah. I think what you say made sense, though. Maybe, right, like what you were talking about in terms of the yeah. meta game, like all of that really checks out, and I think it was. I, I think it makes a lot of sense to me, like why you ended up playing. Yeah, Lotus Field. Uh, Lotus Field had a very bad time. It was again the fourth most fourth most sorry fourth most popular deck and had a forty six win rate. Uh, both both my teammates who did very well. With Lot- um, at the PT, uh, Adrian Inigo Tastet and uh, um, Sean Godhard, they finished uh, 13th and 19th, actually went 5 and 1 in limited and 5 5 with, uh, oh. <laughs> with Lotus Field. In fact, Adrian was very, very sorry, Adrian went 6 4. Adrian was very, very close to, I guess also Sean went 6 4, never mind. That, that's, that's, that's better than 5 5. Yeah, um, it's not. Anyway, <laughs> what I wanted to say is that. Uh, Congratulations to Adrian, who on his very first Pro Tour started the Pro Tour 9-1, uh, actually super close to top 8, then losing a bunch of them at the end, finishing in 
13th place. But, you know, first Pro Tour, it's it's just fantastic. So a very, very nice guy from Spain. Uh, 23 years old, definitely uh, a lot of hope uh, for the future of professional magic. So I, I wish him the best. The future great um, of Spain. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of good, solid Spanish young players. I'm actually very glad to see them around. You know, let's see if... Uh... The new generation can actually. Uh, yeah, another you know. another very young <laughs> uh, Spanish player, uh, um, Gabriel Soto, lost the final uh, of the PTQ, the, the on the Sunday. Yeah, there, uh, it's. I mean, I personally enjoy just seeing you know this this young player just putting the results there. It's kind of refreshing in a way, you know. Um, yeah, same, yeah. same. Well, one thing I wanted to p- point worry. about Pioneer is we have talked a lot in this podcast last year about how shitty Pioneer was. Uh, the games were actually pretty good, right? Like, yeah. that, that's that's something that changed from, like, some other situations. Like, I felt like the games were actually very interesting compared to... I think Pioneer got better in the last month. Like, it was t- definitely better than the last time I played uh, it the very great. list. No, it was yeah. legitimately very fun. We enjoyed... I mean, we, we had a lot to analyze in all of the games and the games themselves were they were just enjoyable especially in the tournament to play like they were high tension and they were tough they were, you know technically difficult like that's what you want out of a pro tour right yeah no and also i think that's part like i think phoenix is actually a very good best deck like because i don't know take ragdus versus phoenix right or phoenix versus bullet control or even phoenix versus amalia they're actually extremely technical and in very different ways like yes. you have to play all these matches very well and you have to play them very differently and they're often very model in the sense like playing Ragnar against Phoenix, every player can have all the roles. Same with Amalek. Like it's, I don't know, I just felt like the games were actually very good quality for my like at least. Oh, fantastic. And yeah, I mean, I'm just, I just wanted to shout like, to say like, well, I have said here, I thought Pioneer was the worst format by a lot because I'm pretty sure I pronounced these words last summer. Uh, I think Pioneer is a very good format to play right now, like for fun or whatever. You know, yep. just... I will definitely play this format for fun. And yeah, I, mean, I just want to point this out just to, you know, to be a little bit still, mango. Uh, <laughs> but still, still, uh, yeah. I'll take a, I'll still take a hater route here. I am still, uh, Ooh, still uh, think that Pioneer is the worst constructed format. We all, we all. He's at Phoenix. I think it's just, it's just too good. And Lotus Field is not very fun. Very hard to interact with. I played a lot of Lotus Field. And so many of my games was just, I don't know, we do our thing, who is the faster wins. And that's just terrible gameplay. So again, I'll uh, still take the uh, the hater route, but uh, I, I'm happy that you guys uh, found it more. We all know that better. there's there's that one hater on this podcast and it's Mangu for sure. So Yeah, Mangu's always, all... for- yeah, yeah. Mangu's always hitting the format. Yeah, yeah he's, exactly. he's just a hater, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean. We don't yeah. listen to the haters, Mangu. I'm sorry. Yeah, we don't. We don't take that hate. We we live in the positivity. Sorry. I love the um, I love the draft. Oh, very draft was open. so good. Every archetype. Yes. <laughs> every archetype combination felt very open. Um, like you know, you didn't have to delete colors like I often do. Yeah, I mean, all, honestly, <laughs> all the draft formats are good except New or whatever it's called for some reason. Uh, yeah, the any other one, form. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean that one was bad. I don't know why. Like. But all the other formats, they just know how to do them good, and they keep doing they keep doing different things. Like I exactly. actually think this like morph with word, so removal, so words or whatever was kind of smart, and they keep doing new things because Lord of the Rings also was kind of new, but still a good form. I I just think they all good. I mean, I'm, I mean, I cannot even like compare exactly, but I think they all just decent. I mean, I I love how they actually make formats so. The decks are kind of stable, but also there's, you know, like the complexity, but also not too much in terms of like attacking or blocking or whatever. And so I think this was kind of experiment, I guess, with the word morphs or whatever, but I think it's a good, like, so one good thing about Limited is like you'll learn how to play and it's kind of with you forever, right? In a way, like you get the basics of Limited. And then so formats change and you have to slightly adjust the the rating of the cards but so we had this format and we had murder as a common which often is an uncommon and it's often the best uncommon or whatever and if it's a common it's the best common by a lot and we had a format that was such as murder is not even among the best commons right um i think that's extremely interesting like i think that's something 
they could maybe will try to do a little bit more, which is like, well, let's make limited formats where some, not all, but like some small amount of the heuristics you often have do not apply as straight as they usually do, which is like removal or, you know, removal is better than not great threats or whatever. And I think that's, that's uh, I don't know if you guys agree with this sentiment, but like, I think that was very refreshing of this format. Like, I will remember this format as the format where murder was not great, right? And that's yeah. the first thing, the first time it happens. Like, and I think that's interesting in terms of like how, like maybe they make a format where one drops are great or whatever. I mean, I, I don't know if that will work, but, you know, just just the fact that the, the classic heuristics we have from Limited were not as easy to apply here, I found very interesting. I think that's just like the fundamental strength of magic. Like there just aren't really fundamental, there aren't very many like fundamental truths and the ones that we think apply often don't actually. So we have all these ideas in the mind, like in air quotes, you know, uh, removal is good or bolt the bird or, you know, make them have, or there's all these like sort of things that people think are true about magic that just often don't apply. And when they don't apply, it's a very big edge to know when that's not true, you know? So I think a big thing that's often the case for magical magic forms is that most of the time, x you know but only most of the time and yeah i really i think wizards does a very good job of subverting expectations um with these sets especially in limited as you say and i I do think they lean into that and i think they're doing so even more now because they're more willing to try bolder and different things so like you say like what what if all the removal of the set just wasn't that good you know i think that that was and it was way more subtle than we realized like when we first looked at the disguise mechanic we would have not we probably didn't realize that ward 2 was going to be that big a deal right but just completely turned absolutely not head. it was yeah i just love this like there's always this discovery that that magic offers you with these formats so yeah I've, i think that i agree with you they've been doing a fantastic job and specifically in this way where they do new things they feel different and there's something to learn uh in them every time so not yeah. only one card yeah like even the ravenous rat there's this like these bad ravenous rats in the format that actually and it being like super bad, but this card's often like solid, right? Like it's a card yeah. you don't have in your decks or whatever. And here it was like very bad. That's also I'm I'm saying like it's not only the murder, but like they're just making like just putting cards we have played before, and they, now they are much worse or much better because whatever reasons. And yeah, that's great. Yeah, I agree with you. Like that's part of the magic of magic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another example was the the artifact, the two mana two one that normally would be that surveils one. Normally it would be unplayable, but here it was so important to have a two drop that could trade with a, a morph that, you know, that one actually was often, uh, you often needed to pick that up because... Uh, yeah, needed, that's uh, true. Yeah, they want the, 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 yeah, the, 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 the thing, the, the machine. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, yeah. but that's good. I mean, yeah, just good job on the format. <laughs> sure, super, super fun. Did you guys play the um, Arena Open last weekend? I did. Anthony did? No, I didn't. Well, I did. I I, I, I opened two codes, two hide and seek, whatever called. Uh, <laughs> I Chorus didn't play Scythe. They won. Yeah, so I opened two and two, and I proceeded <laughs> to go to get seven wins with those cards. Uh, and the two, I drafted a blue red coat cloak deck again. <laughs> I got four zero, <laughs> and then I won two two in the last one. I actually was very close to actually win some of the matches, but I just decided to mana screw it uh does, but it was, it was fun no not win anything uh that was three two or two two i don't remember it was 500 bucks so oh 500 okay yeah, yeah good awesome. good yeah good for some you yeah. know some burger expeditions yeah. uh thank you good i job. mean i usually don't play them and when i play them i usually don't do well so it's definitely better than my average lately but i mean i think the um the opens are just fun and limited formats are good so the games are often good and specifically Playing the format, you have tested for the PT. It's, it's nice. like <laughs> it's like the biggest edge you can probably get in a tournament arena, right? Where the format is somewhat new, it's three weeks or whatever, and you have played for a PT. So you actually have analyzed and thought about it a lot. And it's an open tournament, so obviously the average level is not super high. Uh, yeah, so definitely. it's uh, If you're if, if I'm at home, I'll, I'll try to play them, but not too hard. Like, I will not stop doing many things to play them, but... Uh, they're also fun, you know. Just I, I like playing in arena. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would have loved to play it. Unfortunately, I was not. I was not able this weekend. But uh, I would, that's I would the thing. Like actually, I think that's the. I mean, as I grow old, I think that's the actual great spot for tournaments like this. Like it's a tournament that if I'm at home, 
I'm kind of excited to play. I'm like, wow, you know, open, that's great. But let's say I have something else. I'm going out for a weekend with my friends or whatever. And I don't feel bad about missing it, right? That's actually wonderful. Like, I don't have the this, like, I don't feel tied to the tournament. Like, in a way, what if I miss it? You know, like, let's say I was not qualified or whatever for RC. Well, I might, might feel that, right? Or even if there's an RC, I have to go there if I'm not qualified for the PT. But here it's like, well, if I cannot play, that's fine. But if I play, I'm, I'm excited for it. And I think that's, uh, I mean, for me, that's that's a sweet spot to me. Yeah, makes sense. We care about freedom and choice a lot, right? In our personal lives. So. Uh, and as Magic players, like, you know, in general, agency is something that we care about a lot. So, Or at least we value highly, I should say. We enjoy it a lot. So the agency to choose the tournaments you want to play is kind of reflective of that. <laughs> yeah, no, but the, yeah, absolutely. I think that's true. But also, you know, often those tournaments are like just, you know, like eight play drafts, you know, if you can play at any time. So I think Arena is a good compromise of that. Like it's just good in the between. Also qualifies for the Arena PTQ, which I forgot, but I remember now. So I don't have to grind oh. the ladder. Wink. <laughs> oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> nice. <laughs> don't yeah. have to grind the ladder. Yeah, as if that wasn't good. Exactly. <laughs> oh, and. Another card that I loved was this land with this guy's Breach of the Tugazi. That was uh, super cool whenever you got to trade with a creature with a land. <laughs> Always a good feeling. Oh, I used to love the the unflippable disguises, you know? Like, I would just stick a thing I couldn't ever flip, and then every time it traded, I was like, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> it's fun, though. I, I think this mechanic is so fun. <laughs> I think yeah, I never played, I never played the actual fun. of color disguise. But this is close enough color to this guys, I guess. Yeah. It's a I little think, better. Well, I think I think we only really did it when we had lots of the tipster. But you know. Yeah. Um, tipster so good. T- yeah. Also, what what was your feeling about the uh the list card? Yeah, like, I wanna ask you about that. From, uh, Hell fun. Yeah, that's the uh, because... enlisted boom and magma in his uh, Thorio deck. I don't know if the magma is good. That that one is unclear to me. It might be good in some decks, but I wouldn't just assume that it is. Um I don't think it's great in most of them. I think the list cards are really interesting. Like, I don't know, they just add even more replayability to these limited formats, especially when people play them more and more and start to rely on data more and more. Being able to mix it up with these, like, very rare situations is... It helps a lot with replayability, so... I don't know. I I really... I I think the change to play boosters was really interesting. I actually enjoy the variance that they have introduced. I think the variance comes through in an interesting way and not a frustrating one. So the changes are really yeah. having applied, right? That's how little I notice. Like, what? this is different than Marsh of the Machines, right? Y- yes. Because we already had a lot of random legend- legends in Marsh of the Machines, didn't it? Did uh, yeah, that was a specific bonus sheet. I- yeah, but there's a wider range Well, now. but I mean, there's bonus sheets every two, every two yeah. sets or whatever. Like, in the prediction, we had some predators or what? Like, there's always, like, random things. So my now the thing is, my problem of these are the same, or are they still changing as well? Uh, no, this is how it is from my now My problem on. with these... Go on. Yeah. With this, the least card is that, like the cards of March of the Machine were kind of curated. They were like they were good. Here, the the least card were, I mean, most of them just you know did not feel like curated card or you know they were like good enough to be put in your deck. So you know you already took us this one already one less card. You have fourteen cards, and then sometimes you have a basic land, and then sometimes you have these like bad cards. I I, I feel like. Yeah, they're just taking away, I don't know, some some draftable and playable cards from the packs for these, I don't know, are, are they fun to open? <laughs> now I don't think about it, but there's so many, like, uh, Hysteria Mass, or just, you know, a lot of, like, random cards like that that you would see in the pack and be like, what what, what is this doing here, you know? So, I, w- I wasn't a fan of the list. I, I, I prefer the, the March of the Machine bonus sheet or the Brothers War, you know, stuff like that. Well, I don't think all of them are bad, but none of them are just bad, bad. Like, a lot of them are, like, bad, but you actually have to try them to find out, which I think is the interesting part. Like, I think it's actually way better that the list has a wide range of playables than that the list is mostly just good cards, because then it just defines the draft format a lot, which was often the case for the Multiverse Legends in March of the Machine. Like, I actually prefer it when there's cards like that. Like, I don't know if Magmore is good when I open it, and that's exciting to me. Like, for the most part, it's not that good. I mean, decent here, but... Stuff like that, or like uh, Mass Hysteria, for example. Like, I actually didn't know if that card was good or not when, when I saw it, right? And, okay, it sucks. It's horrible. You should probably never put it in your deck. But that process of discovery was way more interesting for having had that card in the set. So, I don't know. I, I think having bad cards in the list is actually a good thing. 
which sounds weird, but I think that makes the format more interesting to to figure out. It's probably worse, like, you know, at the end of the format, but I think I care a lot more about the start of the format being fun than the end of the format, because uh, that, like, you, you would only really know about that if you played, if you were going to play the format, like, a lot more than I think the average player does. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I agree. I mean, the manga criticism is actually reasonable. Like, there's also some cards that were, like, in between, like, Ixidor, for example, you know, it was like, well, this looks interesting with the morph mechanics, you know, but then it's, like, just not very good. Uh, but I think some of... I mean, there aren't that many cards that are, like, mass hysteria level of that, right? Yeah. Like, there are some of those, but they're very rare. Like, even, you know, some key captain or whatever... Like, these cards actually could be tr- somewhat played in a way. They're good. And uh, even, even like, the presence of something like a Death Cloud, I am not annoyed by that. Like, I think Death Cloud is like, well, it's probably bad, but what if it's, like, a, you know, Vanguard in the, the right deck? <laughs> like, I think some of them it's... are, like, kind of potentially fun. I'm not a big fan of, like, the Vampire 5 mana that just does nothing or whatever, but, like, some of the cards were... I mean, the first draft I played, my opponent played Jay's Wilder of Mystery, so... I was like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, I, I still am not that annoyed by that. I think it's, but I think that's the right power level, if that makes sense for for my taste. Like, I don't know. I, I mean, if they're glory bringers, it's gonna be bad, right? But as long as they're good cards, but actually just you know, sometimes it's good. I think it's fine. I do agree that the the 14 cards plus the land or whatever makes, like, the boosters a little bit too small. And, um, you know, like, uh, yeah, it's just, like, like it's a different texture. I mean, you, you can ask from different f- things from the list and you will form a, a sheet like the Bodos War, I think, where you had the Gunkal engine, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, I do think they are curated in that regard, for sure. Yep. Right, Mango, you have something Flavor else to tell about I'm, to tell us. <laughs> I play Broom Call Engine in Mario now. What? I'm, a, I'm an amulet, amulet main. What? Oh, when you say Worm Call in player. Modern, I think of Tron. Like, I thought you were declaring yourself as a Tron yeah. player. I was like, oh, me too. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, that's true. I didn't think about that. <laughs> when we played no, Broom Call Engine to, in the PT. I just love to put Worm Call Engine in my amulet sideboard. Never. All right, we were forgetting. Yeah. We 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 didn't tell the listeners like Mango, you actually qualified again. Like you keep qualifying yes. to all the tournaments. It is amazing. I like quali- Mango, you keeps qualifying to every tournament. Like in the actual like somewhat last chance or whatever. Like it's yeah. great. He's a cat with nine <laughs> lives. We say. Yeah. Well, maybe like twenty five definitely... lives or something. I don't know. <laughs> I definitely did not plan to play Rakdos vampires, but. Um... Yeah, that that was my my deck of choice for the Sunday PTQ, and I got there somehow. I basically just failed with Amalia, although I knew that it would have been decent if my list was good. But I kind of was just basically like, whenever I do bad with a deck, I never want to play that deck again. <laughs> so, we know, we know, we know. Mango, mango, mango. That, that's why we thought you will not play Phoenix in the PT because you did once bad with Phoenix. <laughs> yeah exactly Called it. Yeah, twice twice, twice. yeah twice <laughs> yeah go on so I literally hated every single pioneer deck and so I had to play the only one that I've never played before in my life which was Rectus Vampires but you know playing a oh so by the way thank you to Arne uh, Ushindath for lending me the deck that was definitely needed since it would have been hard to um, put the deck together because I believe no nobody had Dusk yeah, Agents yeah the them. Sila, that <laughs> would be <laughs> hard yeah how, how how was the deck? like? So when I ask about this, like you never played the deck before, but also your opponents didn't. So you actually felt like I think you made a good choice actually playing this deck. With what you're saying, but like, you, did you feel that this effect were because sometimes you play a deck that's new and you don't know it, but they also don't. Do you also feel like this? The problem is that I really didn't know it. Like, actually, didn't know some of my cards, which <laughs> involves me making some mistakes. The card that I didn't know the most was. Atlatzots, which has so much text and I didn't know a lot of it. Like, for example, I didn't know that if you go Lightning Axe, discard a land, I would make a bot. And that bot, 
I didn't make it, that bot would have been huge because I ended up dying to a crackling drink attack that I could have chum blocked and then on top with Aklat Sots and etc. So yeah, it was uh, a lot. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, for sure. My opponents also didn't know. I believe uh, the Preacher of the Schism was another very tricky card. There was a lot of little combo with uh, the Soaring sacrificing some vampires. Um, like I believe one of my Ap Amalia player decided to play an Amalia, which ended up dying to Soaring. Uh, it, it, there was definitely a lot of uh, yeah, just uh, tricky, tricky situations. I. I ended up winning a game against an opponent who had Etherflux Reservoir, Amalia, and White Growth Walker in play. But they just, you know, didn't draw a spell for a turn. And I ended up turning the corner. One uh, question, Mango, about this. I want to ask, uh, sorry, I have questions. I have other questions. Uh, so did you feel the deck was, like, very good? Or it was, like, one of these days where you have the day and things go away or whatever? Like, did you feel like the deck was, like, actually super strong or more like, you know, cards fell my way, I'll take it down? Yeah, so this deck is supposed to be bad against Amalia. Like, Rakdos is supposed to be very bad against Amalia. But actually, I was able to beat two Amalia thanks to uh, one of the three games I did the thing. Like, I went Soaring Beer and Reaper on turn three. And once you do that, you know, yep. every bad matchup <laughs> turns into At least okay. Decent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Uh, yeah, and the, 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 the Vein Reaper... Like you can actually copy this thing with Fable. It sound it sounds like whatever you don't need it, but you know it actually kills. You them. get to like win the game on the spot. Yeah. You, get, you get to win the game on the spot when you when you. So how does it work? You, you attack that. for you actually kill them, kill them, right? Like eighteen or twenty. Yeah, I mean you attack for a lot, and also end of turn when when the token dies, it triggers the. So you attack for sixteen. So, that's sixteen damage in game four. Sometimes I I had like Fable flipped with a Goblin Shaman. I like. Copy the Goblin Shaman with Fable, attack, and then play cast Vein Ripper post combat, and then the Goblin Shaman dies and triggers Vein Ripper. So I think I will like this deck. <laughs> I mean, yeah, also, it's black red. <laughs> uh, an <laughs> another another interaction that I didn't know that came up was that I had Leyland of the Void in play, and uh, my opponent creature dies. You don't trigger Vein Ripper. And that's something yeah. I I didn't think uh, when I was oh, playing. Okay. Um, so when it came up, I was like, oh yeah, you know that was a mistake. So it kind of sucks to make mistakes because you didn't you didn't test, but that's actually what happens when you play that for the first time, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean that's hard. Like that's gonna happen to every one of us, I guess. But at least your opponents also can make that. I think. Like I think if the deck is new, like it's different to pick up this deck and play it in a tournament than pick up Phoenix and play it for the first time in a tournament where your opponent will have played 100 games against it. But this time, yeah. maybe your opponents also will have never played against these cards. Like, maybe they never played against Sorin. So it's actually reasonable for them to make mistakes. Yeah, or maybe or maybe they don't have a cyber guy that yes. they've played against, so they have to cyber Yeah, on yeah the they don't even know what the matchup is about. I mean, that, that, yeah, they I'm not sure they also got edge. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah, and... Um, the tournament actually was um, had a, a quite a strange uh, tournament structure, uh, and so we were 131 people. This is the Sunday PTQ that basically it's called Second Chance PTQ. So all the PT players that aren't qualified, uh, they weren't qualified to Seattle after the PT, were invited to this PTQ. So he had, uh, I think, like That's a lot the, of people, the right? Main, 30, yeah, the, the main event, the main event was 257. The PTQ was 131, so I would say that uh, half, about half of the um, of the Pro Tour players requalified, and about half of the Pro Tour players uh, played in this PTQ. But it's a tough tournament, right, Mengu? Like I, I, I see these PTQs when I go there, and they seem like very high level tournaments. Like they actually, from the outside, so they feel like th it's very high level. Yeah, this one was obviously a very much high variance because it was single elimination. So what happened was um, 131 players, six players. <laughs> um, played around one and 125 players got the buy so they like named the six player on the microphone that's kind of like super feel bad moment for the people named um, and then the six player played and then we had 128 people and uh, after five rounds we would have four players um, uh, Robert Cranko, Justin Chin Liam Kane and, and me uh, Liam Kane actually is uh, one of my teammates uh, super young player from Canada uh, congratulations to him and um, and yeah, so what happens was that uh, you had to win uh, 
five. I had to win five matches. I have to go. I had to go five row. I beat Phoenix Control to Amalia, and then Boris Convoke in the final. So that has yeah. to be a good matchup, right, for this egg main Reaper. This yeah, that must be insane. Dominion, uh, <laughs> also, the Sword in Life. Yeah, it has to be. A good uh, well, the, rest yeah, the rest I mean, of the deck's not good against Convoke, though. So you do have to have like. I would say that well, yeah, Convoke but... is usually favored against vampires, but it's also like a high variance deck. So he had a amazing draw game too, where he just kind of killed me on turn three or something like that. And the other two games, he was not very impressive, and Stumble. I was able to just play Rak- Rakdos mid range style. Uh, I never did the I never did the thing against him, but yeah, sometimes you go do this push Fable and they die. I understand, but um, it was uh, honestly the my. I had a lot of moments in this in this PTQ where I felt like not knowing the deck was super harmful and I was playing bad, but thankfully I was uh, bailed out by by yeah I don't know <laughs> the, 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 the by the, of, the so. deck. Well, I mean, I, you also played well, you know. Like it's I've seen, I've seen, I've seen you some, play some, enough. some games, yeah, some games, some, some games. That's some enough games. sometimes. Some games, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's enough. I mean, we all make mistakes, you know. Like, uh... all right, Anthony, what's the biggest mistake you made in this tournament? You know, it's kind of doomed because I have to think about it and pick between them. All right, all right. <laughs> oh, oh my lord! I've oh, oh that 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 has to be a story for another time. Surely the 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 one from the first draft. The one for the first draft. I don't remember, but do you remember? It involves so... uh, involves a nervous gardener. Oh, I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the greatest stories. Uh, let's go. I'm such an not, idiot. Did you, did you not another time, another time? Did you not put a Did you not put a basic land in your deck? Oh no, this is way. <laughs> it, this is so much worse, worse than that. No, I, I, it's, it's actually I too thought, long. Though. It's another time. But this, yeah, right. we have a lot of stories. Maybe we'll tell some next next time. But oh, this one is incredible. You shuffle your hand into your deck. You next time, mango. next time, mango. <laughs> but don't worry, it's stupider than that. I'm gonna say mine. It's easy. I just cracked a clue against a Krenko. And oh, fuck. that's not good but fortunately my opponent also didn't notice so <laughs> because i i obviously like i didn't know equal trigger to krenko so i was not like wait wait what? oh yeah this is important what? would you say that you didn't have a clue a clue that it would i did not have a clue <laughs> yeah i definitely did not have a clue <laughs> come on Anthony. why 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 I mean, it's just like but we I, all make mistakes once again, and it's really hard to play. Even, even like I think I played actually fairly well in this PT, but even if you play fairly well, you're gonna still make mistakes. Uh, I don't. I don't like when Mengu is rough to himself. So yeah, no, that's fair. There was a moment in this tournament that it was super dead. I thought it was super dead. It was game three against Amalia. It was I think it was round three or round four, or whatever. And I mulligan to six, and my hand is four lands, two fatal push after putting a land or land on the bottom. And my first four draws were four lands. I played two fight out push and my hand was four lands and my battlefield was four lands. And that's it. And I thought Oops. it's over. Like I can never win. And then I draw Thoughtsies. I thought is my opponent who's on three lands, four cards in hand. And his end is the recollected company, Knight Errant of Eos. Okay? So as soon as he draws a land, it's over, right? Never but do it. <laughs> some- Somehow, he, like, takes a while before drawing the fourth land, and I draw, like, Harvester into Harvest... Sorry, Harvester into Crack Clue. Sorry, Crack Blood, play Fable on turn six. Um, so, so I drew, like, bro- uh, Harvester into Fable. And then, like, the game continues, and it's that one where he had the Reservoir, Amalia, and the Wagger Walker, and literally any spell kills me, and he draws a land. Um, and then, just from there, I win, but it's just... And, like, I had to exile the Lunark Veteran earlier with the Hive of Die Tyrant. Actually, having played Amalia helped me a lot in that match. I think if I didn't know how to play Amalia, I would have lost that match. So it's good that my Amalia treated me very poorly in the tournament, but at least saved me in the PTQ the day after by just playing against it. No, definitely. I mean, no, knowing that deck definitely makes you better against it, right? Like, it's, it's just going to happen like that. So uh, sometimes uh, there is some spot where uh, my opponent like drew for turn and then looked at the graveyard and I immediately knew they had returned to the ranks and then like later like thought seized instead of another play and they had returned to the ranks. Like things like this are, um, 
they seem a small thing, but actually you mean a lot. Oh, uh, be careful. Yeah. <laughs> you might get tricked one day. <laughs> no, I know. I know there could be a bluff situation, but it's it's hard. Like, you know, when you play like these, let's say, high stakes, uh, very, very tense game, it's difficult to bluff. Like, your mindset is so much on like playing well. Though? But I, <laughs> could, I, one day, one day I could. I'm just saying that let the things that happen in this tournament. All right, I, not that, I'll help. Advice for listeners: help me win. If you play against Mangu, just make sure you pick up your graveyard every three draw steps or so. Okay, just do that for me. Just have have a squiz every three draw steps. Just be like, yeah, exactly. You need to <laughs> you need to keep the range open. You can't do it only when you. When you draw a turn to the ranks, yeah, my <laughs> Which advice the is card? My, my advice is gonna be the opposite to the listeners. Just like yeah. the, the way you, I actually had the situation where Brett against Stefan, and I don't exactly remember what happened, but he was like, "Well, I don't know what you will think because I thought that be that." I was like, "Listen, <laughs> I just completely ignore whatever my opponent does in terms of time, where they look, or whatever. I just completely ignore it, like because yeah. it could be them tricking me." But also, it's in a situation where they choose to enable that kind of level battle, right? So while I would be like to be involved in a leveling mind battle, if they're choosing to trigger it. So my advice is just like, I, I, what I do is just completely ignore us if it never happened. Yeah, That's and sometimes it's just something totally yeah. unrelated. Like, you know, it's, there's, there's a bit, it's a bit too difficult to read into that stuff, I think. And it's quite dangerous. And like, it genuinely takes some degree of mental effort, which is usually better placed elsewhere like sometimes it's free but i think it's mostly too not worth it it's too dangerous and, uh, yeah but anyway mango yeah, qualified yeah. again so we're all all the three qualified for the pt once again i think yes. that's uh, kind of that's kind of cool i know i mean yeah we I, I can't remember which one the last one was that we thought oh, maybe this will be the last one and then we were just wrong like four times in a row or something so <laughs> yeah, but you make fun of me when I say those things, but no one makes fun of you oh, yeah. saying those things. Well, yeah, don't. I mean, yeah, you know, obviously, because Xavier keeps insisting that maybe this is his last one ever, and then, uh, you know, top eight's like three in a row, or whatever he does. Well, so. but this one is next one is not going to be my last one, presumably. No, so you'll probably still I'm not say saying anyway. this again. No, I'm not saying it anymore. But this could be the last one we're all three qualified. You know, so let's see. If yeah, no, and Mango's going to win another second chance. Thank you, hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> go on. And we even uh, got a uh, uh, pictures of the three of us together. Oh, so that's next, nice. Uh, that's thumbnails nice. Uh, taken by a very kind fan. Actually, time. yeah, that was that was really nice. Of yeah, them. we we asked. So uh, a fan of ours and, and a lot of people came up to ask for, and um, of course, signatures and pictures to the three of us. Um, a lot of people uh, watches the carnies, listen to the carnies, and etc. And actually, one of the people uh, asked us a picture, and in return, we asked them to take us a bunch of pictures. So you did that, uh, not yeah, us. The, yeah, it was it was <laughs> you, not us. Yeah, it was all of you, Mango, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> that was so nice. There were a lot of people I mean, that came I, up to us. It was really, really. I take a lot of pictures with people. Sometimes I ask uh, ask a favor back. It's <laughs> it's, a, it's a fair. It's a totally fair. Trip. Yeah, thanks for the pictures. They were, they were actually cool. And now we have one together, so we don't have to be like. Photoshopped or anything. Yeah, do some Photoshop, some pictures from. We can still Photoshop where, each other, you know, if you miss it. You but... actually weren't there. Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> for all time. That, that that that's the story. That's the story. Um, all right, is okay. this good for the shall week? We, yeah, shall we wrap up and uh, say goodbye to all the listeners again? If you enjoyed the show, remember that you can join patreoncom carnies to uh, talk with us and on Discord whenever you want and uh yeah anything else guys you have to say uh no actually that you know it's uh, very fun to very funny fun funny is it fun or funny anthony fun very it fun. could be it's both. fun but it's fun to actually ah, you, you always say this ah, whatever <laughs> i am really glad to you know keep going with this podcast uh because we really enjoyed it and it's also very you know um I don't know, like it feels good when actually running to people that actually like the podcast so you know, we also like doing it. So let's see how long we can keep doing that because it's great and I have a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you <laughs> thank to you all of you who approached us. I, I really appreciate that because I was surprised by how many people came up and said something nice. Um, but yeah, each and every one of you, it was, it was very it was very nice to, to meet all of you. I enjoyed that a lot. And I hope to meet a lot more of you in the future as well. Hope to see a lot of you again, in fact. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Bye.